Let me first and foremost uh, thank colleagues from UNSW uh, for inviting me to take part in this symposium. Um, all that is left for me to do is to talk to you about a continent of 54 states in maybe just about five or six minutes. Actually, 55 states, uh, uh, I forgot to count South Sudan. Um, I guess my quick presentation will be to talk about the dynamics. Africa is an embodiment of contradictions, cutting across all of those uh, states and their entities. But when we talk about the higher education system, you begin to see the tensions and the contradictions in an even clearer way. Um, we have higher education systems and universities that face what I call a double jeopardy. They're suffering from a crisis of identity and they have stunted growth. And yet, this is where the contradictions begin to emerge. We're talking of a continent that at this moment uh, you have a whole range of societal contexts that have unprecedented growth in many areas, and I'm not talking about economic growth now, and massive potential for innovation. So three things that I want to do very quickly is to talk about the context that produces this kind of contradictions. And when you look at that context, uh, you would find familiar things with the sort of conversations we've been having. Uh, I think, Philip, when you talked about the Western Hemisphere, you saw already uh, the disconnect with, the, with uh, Latin America. When we talked, when Raj talked about India, we saw that distinctiveness. All of a sudden, we're talking about global community, and suddenly, we're seeing the sharp differences when we look at particular regions. Africa is a continent of, I'm not putting up any data here because I also don't want to use uh, dodgy data. There's no point. Let me speak in broad headline strategic terms about what the issues with higher education uh, should be, uh, should, what issues we should be examining in Africa. You're talking about a continent of 1.2 billion people where approximately 65% are under the age of 30. And if you look at that 18 to 24 year bracket, um, you begin to see, as we saw in, in the case of South uh, Asia, a massive number of people that are just pushing the doors to go into higher education, at least half a billion. And that actually will be a cons conservative estimate when you take some of the big countries and the trends you see in those big countries. Unlike Asia, Africa's youth bulge is rising. It's going to continue to grow in that way until around 2050, at least if we go by the UN estimates, notwithstanding the intervening variables as well. So you're talking about a continent where some countries already produce about half a million graduates a year. And if you look at really the public universities that are worth their salt, a little bit, uh, you know that you can say, okay, maybe they're worth their salt, they're less than 400 across the continent. Countries like Nigeria are producing rapidly a number of private universities of varying qualities. At the moment, six of the top ranking uh, African universities of the 15, out of 15 top African universities are located in one country. South Africa, so you can actually see the, you know, uh, the kinds of contradictions and tensions that we're talking about. Brain drain, I, and of course, in Africa, only really less than a dozen of all of those universities are in the top 1,000. I mean, we saw the rankings that were put here. So that, that's the nature of the challenge we're talking about. Now, yet in that continent, you see massive potential for innovation. And actually, it is taking place on a daily basis. Africa is little researched. When you see the kinds of innovations that are taking place uh, at different levels of the community, I'm not talking about the level of the state. So in terms of adaptations, when you talk about technology, the most innovative things are happening, what you can do with mobile money. Uh, we use that rapidly in Africa, low bandwidth technology. And actually, those who are already beginning to experiment with you know, the idea of Bitcoin. There are a couple of African countries that are picking this up already. So people are ready to take risk 
in order to transform their lives. But there's another story, which I think we need to take into account when we look at the state of African um, uh, institutions of higher learning. One is the brain drain. Many of us are in Europe. Uh, we probably came here to study, in my own case, I came here to study, thought I'll do my master's and PhD in five years, and that was 30 years ago, I'm still here. Uh, and that story is not unusual. But what you also see the kind of brain drain from many, from academics moving from their home universities to Southern Africa. Initially it was Botswana, South Africa, Zimbabwe, of course, after Zimbabwe, South Africa is feeling the pressure. And there's a reason for that. Last point about that context is the contestation. Massive, serious contestation taking place between, you know, within society, but between society and the state, or more precisely, uh, governing elite almost across the board to varying degrees. The difference is not that of a matter of substance, but of degrees, by the way. And where do we see universities fall in all of those places? You begin to see, to understand the tensions that universities are feeling at the moment. And I want to quickly highlight four of those tensions. There's a tension between wanting to develop in the, in the, in the mirror image of world-class universities. So, of course, a rush to deal with rankings on the term of the global uh, rankings. I told you earlier, the less than a dozen in the top 1,000. So even if they wanted to be in the top 100 or 500, uh, we don't think it will be any time soon. Yet, there's a tension between wanting to do that and adapting to the local context. So in a number of African countries, you do not have the polytechnics. What Philip was talking about earlier, about community colleges that are absolutely important for, and actually they bat the energy of that kind of development at community level that then integrates uh, upwards, if you like. In Nigeria, for example, the notion of polytechnics or technical colleges where you're able to do that and get people to, into vocational uh, training very early on. That, of course, disappeared. Right about the same time that uh, polytechnics disappeared in the UK. And you wonder, why would you close polytechnics in a developing country uh, just because? I'm, I'm not saying that's the only reason, but I'm, I'm telling you the, 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 the point about wanting to mirror uh, world-class institutions. That's an example of it. But that's what you have. And therefore, uh, a, younger, a, a younger generation of people are striving to go into universities when actually those universities are not adapted uh, to, uh, to the opportunity structures in society. A second area of tension is a focus on traditional approach, a rigid adherence to traditional approaches to funding and sustainability when actually and is, there's a tension between that or going for broke and actually aligning with industry more, maybe businesses more. And you can see those tensions in the sorts of little initiatives that some universities uh, are taking. A third one, and I think this is a very, very important uh, tension to look at, is that of not, you know, trying to decide whether to be interventionist or not. Interventionist or to just stand by in those contestations that are going on in society. We've seen the protests, the student protests in South Africa. We have seen that in Burkina Faso. We, we saw what happened in North Africa. By the way, in my own world, I don't separate North Africa from Sub-Saharan Africa. So what you see in the end is when university leadership should clearly intervene, and that goes back to the first conversation we had this morning uh, on the leaders panel. That generosity of spirit, the need to actually try to transform and improve the world, uh, which you see independent thinking, which is the role of universities. You find many universities try to separate the institution from the dynamics in society. That's an area of tension because still, notwithstanding, and globalization is not what uh, fractured the relationship between the state and universities in Africa, if you, if you like. It goes back uh, to the 80s and the idea of structural and the imposition, if you like, of structural adjustment program by the World Bank. The World Bank has since then said it got it wrong, but we're still dealing with that of states that have distanced themselves in terms of resources, uh, minimal resources, and I speak generally now because you can still see the differences between 
uh, some Southern African countries and a couple of North African countries. But the fact is, we then see a situation where the very students that we're trying uh, to develop see the universities as accomplices with states that are not necessarily uh, looking after society as they should. Final area of tension is between pursuing what we know is unequal partnership between northern institutions, um, but of course it will bring short-term benefits. There's a tension between that uh, and partnering regionally with other universities that can add to the voice so that they collectively partner with northern universities on their own terms. And actually, more often than not, uh, as we partner across, uh, across the continent with the universities, the question you ask is, what's your agenda? What's your, what, do you, what are your expectations? What are your priorities? And it's very rare. In rare cases, you see that clear cut, well thought through as strategic priority that is articulated because there are loads of areas of common ground. And so, as far as I'm concerned, this is a message to us to know what to check, what to look out for, the kinds of questions to ask so that we don't do any harm. This tends to happen uh, largely in post-conflict countries or war-affected contexts. To my very last um, as a set of comments, therefore, what, what will an African, what will the African higher education system look like, assuming we tried uh, to breach these tensions, assuming we try to reconcile the contradictions that I was just talking about. I, I think we'll be looking at a higher education environment, landscape, or system, whatever we want to call it, that is adapted to society and its opportunity structures. Therefore, we would have more confident, competent higher education institutions that are able to speak directly, adapt directly to their own context, uh, I would see many more universities where agriculture uh, and the economics of it and the technology of it is at the heart of curriculum. Uh, and it might be very much so that you limit yourself to those areas where you're of most relevance without the, uh, you know, or never, or very difficult struggle of trying to become a world-class university, as I said earlier. We would see higher education institutions that are adapted to available technology and actually therefore enhance access. I don't think anytime soon we'll see the kinds of uh, G5 technology being developed uh, elsewhere at the moment in Africa, but partnerships to do that can occur. But low bandwidth and, and solar technology, all the things that can be adapted to the environment, including the use of radio for education, all those things can be tapped into and we're seeing that anecdotally. We will see African universities that will become regional universities <coughs> first before they are state-led national universities. Why? Because you can't take a terrain like the Sahel where for thousands of years people have moved and crisscrossed borders. And actually services follow people. Only humanitarians get that well. So that if services will follow people, we should see educational uh, provision and educational establishments that are following and are more borderless. Somebody talked about transnational education earlier. That therefore do not respect borders at, as much. And you see that kind of collaboration between universities along regional lines. We have to think outside the box. And I think that is an idea whose time has come uh, in Africa. We'll see universities who are more entrepreneurial in engagement with industry uh, in a country where people are as poor as Nigeria, uh, the breweries sell the most beer across the country. Guinness makes massive profit. So you, you can see the things, and yet industry, which should sit side by side with the universities, because therefore that partnership will produce not just students, the resources and everything that goes with it, and you hear these ideas, but the nervousness and the need to stay rigidly uh, to, you know, to the structures that we know does not allow us to collaborate in those ways. Uh, my very uh, last point, uh, as I want to conclude, is to also speak to what I know and do uh, at the moment. We will see we need universities that are more uh, able to exercise leadership, thought leadership, and lead innovations in education. 
uh, and transform African societies to adapt uh, to the times. Therefore, to conclude, I think a selective and sustained focus on a generation of future leaders and change makers across the African uh, continent and across universities in Africa will offer the hope uh, for the transformation of higher education in Africa. I don't want to leave us on a pessimistic note. What I see on a daily basis is a self-confident generation of Africans, future leaders who we rarely tap into because universities have not learned to appreciate them. And our partnerships will do well to begin to look into those terrains for transformation, for engagement, so that we can have a more global picture uh, in terms of higher education collaboration. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for me for um, providing that concluding presentation for what's been an extraordinary journey around the world. We might have one question very briefly before we um, continue discussions over lunch. Just one of them. Please, thank you. Hi. Um, thanks very much. Um, question, to what extent is there um, African level government collaboration, African Union, about research funding, collaboration around quality assurance, to what extent are the countries coming together? Well, thank you very much. I, I, I think actually that's a very, very uh, important question. There's a Pan-African conversation about education. And actually across the board, across the board, whether we're talking through uh, what the African Union does in the area of security and development, uh, or what they call the peer review mechanism or education and governance, we have a very strong, a, a very strong normative framework exists, which actually if it was applied because of the principles that underpin pin that, you begin to see transformation. So there's a potential there. There's an agenda 2063 for the continent, which also projects to 2063. The, the big debate there is, okay, can we at least try to project for the next 10 years a little bit before we get to 2063. What the Pan-African University does is to give us a template. It's based in Cameroon. But at the moment, there's much focus on training uh, postgraduate level. We bring uh, researchers, uh, educators from outside. But we have not yet. It's also structured around the traditional approach. And it suffers, to my mind, and I, I think that there's scope for debate there, the same sort of tensions and contradictions that I've just described. I would like to see a Pan-African university where we take the template, uh, what we've articulated as far as normative framework, we take that and we just let uh, the constituents of students and academics who are operating across borders because they have to operate transnationally, let them run with it and adapt all of that uh, to the African communities where the students and academics are based. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're going to thank you. Thank you for me. And we're going to reconvene at 2 o'clock. And you'll be pleased to know we'll have an alternative chair who will be much more disciplined than I have been. But thank you. <laughs>